great to be with you guys. Thank you so much for uh, having me come. Thanks for the invitation. Odd for me as a speaker, this is the third talk today I've given in this room, uh, each time to a different group, and now here we are. And now we are looking at some um, church membership, which I am happy to do with you. Uh, Steve mentioned nine marks. We do have things for you in the foyer. If you want to just give us your name and email address, you'll get the e-journal uh, that comes out every other month, which uh, Jonathan Lehman works on and does an extremely good job on. Uh, this last one, January, February, was on corporate prayer and the importance of corporate prayer. Uh, he gets articles from all kinds of people who I'm a little surprised when he gets back to me and says, hey, so-and-so just agreed to write an article for us. Really? Yeah, they did. So uh, probably faculty members here at Trinity. Jonathan sometimes asked to write articles. Thank you for doing it. Uh, the one coming up in March, April, the next one out, is going to be on cooperation. How do we theologically and in a principled fashion think through cooperation with other Christians? And there are a number of uh, fun little bits in that one. But anyway, if you, if you give us your name and email address, you'll be on that list. And there's a nine mark sampler you can pick up of interviews uh, with folks like John MacArthur, Jim Packer, Philip Jensen, uh, John Piper, Thabiti Anyabwile, R.C. Sproul, Paige Patterson, Ligon Duncan, anyway, others uh, that are there for you. And then a, a wonderful bookmark. And uh, a copy of the book that you are welcome to take away with you. And if we have any extras left over there at the end, Mike, are we going to have any extras left over at the end? Yeah. Yes. Well, if we do, take them. So if it's, if it's near the end and you want to say, hey, can I take two or three copies for other leaders in my church? Please, take them. We, we don't need to take them back to Washington. So thank you for serving us in that way. Philip Melanchthon's Augsburg Confession was prepared in 1530 to display the legitimate nature of Protestants as Christians, to show that Lutherans were Orthodox, and to show this specifically to the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. Uh, it is the most influential of the Lutheran creeds. Article 7 in the Augsburg Confession reads as follows. It's also taught among us that the one holy Christian church will be and remain forever. This is the assembly of all believers, among whom the gospel is preached in all its purity, and the holy sacraments are administered according to the gospel. For it is sufficient for the true unity of the Christian church that the gospel be preached in conformity with a pure understanding of it, and the sacraments be administered in accordance with the divine word. It is not necessary for the true unity of the Christian church that ceremonies instituted by men should be observed uniformly in all places. As Paul says in Ephesians 4, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Let me read to you uh, just that middle sentence again. It is sufficient for the true unity of the Christian church that the gospel be preached in conformity with a pure understanding of it, and that the sacraments be administered in accordance with the divine word. Now this became reiterated across scores of confessions, books, and other writings of the 16th century reformers across Europe. The Lutheran Reformation recognized that the Reformation was more than recovering the gospel preached in conformity with a pure understanding of it, though that was the essence of it. Or, as we express it in shorthand, the word being rightly preached. Sometimes Lutheranism is spoken of as if that's all it was about. But that's not faithful to the early Lutherans, like Melanchthon, who wrote the Augsburg Confession. The word being preached rightly, the gospel being preached rightly, was certainly fundamental, essential, primary. But it alone was insufficient. The pure water of the word poured out had to be received, captured in the lives of a community of people in order to be a truly Christian congregation. And so there was what came to be called the second mark of a true church the sacraments be administered in accordance with the divine word. Now, the two articles later, Melanchthon specifically rejected what he called Anabaptist errors, 
And this, this second mark in the hands of the reformers after him came to describe the congregation of those justified through faith alone in Christ alone. The right administration that later reformers wrote of was not fundamentally an assertion of paedo-baptism against Protestant Anabaptists, though they sometimes did that expressly in their confessions. But rather, it was against Rome's teaching that the sacraments conveyed God's saving grace, ex opere operato, apart from any reference to the faith with which they were received. In that sense, at least among the Reformed, this second mark of a true church acted to identify and unify true believers apart from those who followed the teachings of Rome. And that's my jumping off point for the consideration I want to lead us in this afternoon. Those Christians who have gone before us have recognized not only the need for the gospel to be preached, as Christ said it should be preached, and as schools like this one have given themselves to make sure it is so preached, but also the gospel received, as Christ said it should be received. Not just by us as individuals, but by us as individuals who regularly congregate. Some neo-Protestants among us, in the name of tradition, have given rise to a new piety, which loathes piety, and a new faith, which seems to be received by tradition doing rather than by heart embracing. But just to be clear, as best I can tell, this is not what the Protestant reformers found in Scripture. It is not what they taught. So in the New Testament, James admonished some early Christians, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. John Calvin, commenting on this, said that God would have us chaste virgins. And it is this chastity which is violated and spoiled by all the impure affections of the world. Reason enough for James to compare love of the world to adultery. What he calls friendship of the world is the state of men who become addicts and slaves of the corrupt side of life. The nature and extent of the world's disagreement with God is such that every step a man takes towards the world is one step further away from God. Hence the repeated command of Scripture to renounce the world if we would serve God. True piety resides not in itself, but in Christ. Such piety does not threaten our reconciliation with God. It naturally and certainly flows from it. And it expresses itself in committed love to God and to our fellow Christians and to others. And it's particularly that committed to love to fellow Christians and to particular fellow Christians that I want us to think about in this time this afternoon. The right administration of baptism and the Lord's Supper presumes church discipline. The Reformers all saw that clearly in Scripture. And that, in turn, presumes church membership. So if you want to try to go for the kneecap of my argument, that's where you want to go. Right? I'm just laying it out to you clear and plain. I'm going to dress it up and try to apply it. But if you want to go for it cognitively, that's what you want to go for. You want to object. So just trust me. The rest of the time here is, is just hanging stuff on that. So let me just say it again. The right administration of baptism and the Lord's Supper presumes church discipline. And church discipline, in turn, presumes church membership. Here's a simple series of thoughts. Christians should attend a congregation regularly. And where they attend regularly, they should join. And if they are able and do not attend, then they should not be allowed to be a member of a Christian church. They are, in fact, in sin. Hebrews 10.25 instructs us not to be like those who forsake the regular assembling 
of themselves together. Disobeying this clear instruction doesn't inspire confidence in the non-attender's ongoing repentance and faith. A member's regular tolerated non-attendance begins to bring up further questions. What kind of leadership must a church have in order to allow such a misrepresentation to grow up and flourish? What kind of expectations are communicated to those who are joining the church? What discipline is practiced? In fact, tolerated non-involvement among members may even call into question the kind of evangelism being done. The church's understanding of conversion, what does it really mean to be a Christian? Or even the gospel itself. Allowing such non-attending members to retain their membership would seem to be such blatant disobedience to Scripture and such a brazen disregard for the spiritual health of those concerned that it would seem even to call into question the teaching that has brought about such an unhealthy tolerance in the body. This, then, is a difficult topic. Practicing meaningful church membership in a world where options are preferred and commitments avoided. How do you regain what is not even understood, even by pastors? How do you make meaningful something that you don't believe in. After all, many Bible-believing Christians today deny church membership as quickly and as easily as many Jehovah's Witnesses deny the Trinity or Muslims deny Christ's divinity. I'm not saying the essence is as important, but I'm saying the method is the same. Show us the verse, they say. But the truth that God has revealed in His Word is not limited to simple, explicit statements. Much of the most important teaching of Christ, if you consider what we know about his relationship to his Father and the Spirit's relationship to the Father and the Son, is best and most clearly understood when passages are compared and teaching systematically constructed. So it is with church membership. But then today we must even ask, what does membership mean in such an amorphous group as a local church? Who even knows what a church is? Among many today, from popular writers to mission strategists, even that definition has faded. This is a difficult topic. But friends, I, I raise it with you because it is even more important than it is difficult. The plan for the talk then is this. First, to define the church. Much of the work that needs to be done here is this initial and foundational work then the membership of the church must be defined. Reasons uh, for the practice and requirements for specific members uh, must be considered. One can't regain what one doesn't even understand has been lost. And then when we have considered what particularly constitutes membership as meaningful, we can consider what steps could be taken by a local congregation to regain such meaningful membership. So in summary, we want to consider what the church is, and then membership in it, and then how that is by definition meaningful, and conclude by considering steps we can take to recapture for a congregation an appreciation of membership's meaning. And all of this is undertaken with a desire to see local congregations built up to the glory of God. First then, a definition of a church. What is a church? Well, it's a common place among pastors to say, that, well, the church is not the building. And many of us are so thankful that's the case. Well, it's certainly true that churches do not need to have buildings. For the first few centuries, Christian congregations owned no buildings as congregations. They met in private homes. It was really a misunderstanding of salvation and the church that grew up in the patristic period that led to the church being reconceived of as regularly requiring specific consecrated spaces. But at the Reformation, it again became apparent that a building was not required for a Christian church. But what was required for a Christian church? What is required 